The Spectre, Part 7, The Jock, The Skater, The Outcast, and The Pretty One. I slammed the book shut and pushed it onto the floor. No, there's... No! How is that possible? I thought to myself. I could feel my heart beating faster than it's ever beat before. It felt as if I could not fill my lungs with enough air. I looked around my room. The once halfway clean room was now a pigsty of papers, clothes, posters, and of course, that book. I've had enough. I ran out of my room, slamming the door behind me, down the hallway and out the front door, still only wearing my socks. I ran into the rainy night and down Blaine Street, passing the Johnston's house until I saw Jen's house, just a few houses down. I ran through the yard and up to the front door. Soaking wet and still out of breath, I collapsed to my knees, lifting my arm up to knock. But I just held my arm there. I didn't know if her family was home or if she had already gone to sleep. What would I tell them? How would I explain this to anyone? They would have me put into an institution or something. I sat there for a minute, got up, turned around, and began walking back out into the rain. I stopped and felt tears begin to form in my eyes. I sucked it up, looked back up, and walked home. When I got there, I took my wet clothes off, took a shower, cleaned my room up a little bit, and just sat in bed for what felt like was an eternity. I heard an IM come across, then another, and another. I laid down in bed, and I don't know how, but I slowly drifted off to sleep. Thursday, October 29th, 1998. I didn't sleep very well that night. I tossed and turned almost the entire night. Finally, at 5.30 a.m., I decided to just get up since my alarm would be going off soon anyways. I unplugged my alarm so it wouldn't go off while I was showering, which I now had to do again since I basically woke up in a pool of my own sweat. I walked to my closet and picked out an outfit for the day, a navy blue shirt, a pair of jeans, and a black jacket that had a Spitfire logo on it. I took my clothes down the hall with me and into the bathroom. I turned the shower on, got in, and just sat there for a minute, thinking about everything that had happened last night. I guess I was in there for a while because I heard a knock at the door. Are you alive in there? Come on, we're going to miss the bus, Holly said. I cleaned myself off and finished up my morning routine. I got dressed and walked out, walking down the hall back into my room. I sat on my bed and put my shoes on when I remembered the IMs I had received last night. I stood up, walking over to my desk. I dragged that chair out, giving me goosebumps as usual. I sat down and turned on the screen. Bury Me Alive 82 and I am Jen 289 had both sent me messages. I opened Johnny's first. Hey, Dr. Lyle specializes in ancient cultures. I guess she's been around for some time. I hope she has answers for us. Then I opened Jen's. Hey, I saw you walking down the street last night from my window. Are you okay? I turned my screen off, grabbed my bag from the corner of the room that it sat in, and started to open the door. I then thought about the book, the one that I held last night, the one with my name in it. I set my bag down and walked over towards it. I picked it up, flipped the pages, and there it was, still staring at me, still taunting me. My name. How could this be, I thought to myself. I shut the book and stuffed it into my already messy book bag. I walked out of my room, down the hallway, and out the front door. I walked down the street, slowly making my way towards the bus stop. Mark, I heard my name called out. Do you want a ride? It said again. I looked over, and it was Jen, standing outside with her mom. I looked both ways and crossed the street. Good morning, Miss Rice, I said. Good morning, Mark. How are you? She asked. I'm all right. Didn't get much sleep last night, but I'll be okay. 
Oh, I know what those days are like. I had plenty of them myself. Marie told me you guys are going to be heading over to the lake after school for a couple hours. Confused, I looked at Jen. Yeah, Mark was telling me it was really nice over there, and I haven't been in a while, and since summer's over, it should be pretty empty. She looked at me again. Yeah, the lake is really nice this time of the year, I said, realizing that this was just a cover story. Oh, well, you two have fun and be careful with all the craziness going on, she said, as she smiled and walked back into the house. I opened the door and sat in the station wagon. Jen did the same. Mark, Jen said. I looked over at her with bags that weighed about 10 pounds under my eyes. Can I ask you a question? Jen said. Of course, I replied. Before we go to Berkeley, I just have to ask, are you up for this? We can stop right now. We can, we can go to the lake, just you and I, and you know, I thought for a second and looked back at Jen. I don't know. I just... I... She took my hand. Do you want to see what the doctor says? I thought about it again and nodded my head. Let's see what the doctor says, I said back. Okay, well, if this is too much, the safe word is... Brake lights. Brake lights? I said back with a confused, humorous grin on my face. Shut up, she said and cracked a smile. Jen started the car and shifted into reverse. The radio clicked on. Two more found dead. However, police have a suspect in custody who is believed to be responsible for the brutal death of... Jen shut off the radio. She backed out of the driveway and started up Blaine Street until she took a ride on the Travis. You don't have to do this, I said. What? she asked. I know... I know that you and I have only known each other for a few days, but I care about you, Jen, and I don't want anything to happen to you. This thing, it's... Jen slowly pulled the car over, stopping by the curb. Mark, I need to tell you something, she said. Has Johnny told you anything about me? She asked. Not really, I said back. I didn't tell you the full story on why I left Callaway, she said. I looked at her confused. What do you mean? I said back. She took a deep breath. Well, she said, I told you that the reason I transferred was that my parents moved and that was only part of the story. The other part, I, a tear rolled down her face. Jen, are you okay? I asked. Yeah, I just didn't think I would be talking about this so soon, you know? I, Jen, you don't have to tell me. It's okay, I said. She took my hand and took a deep breath. I tried to hurt myself, Marky. She rolled up her sleeve and removed the band she wore over it. Jen, I said as my heart began to shatter. I was seeing this person, and they were not good to me. When I finally worked up the courage to break things off, they told the entire school an ugly, untrue rumor about me. I had friends who stopped talking to me, and I felt like felt like you had a target on your chest, I added. Yes, just like that. I began to hurt myself in the spring, and not to mention all the letters and stuff I got passed to me. It was hard, Marky. I just, I, I, she covered her face as she started to weep. I let go of her hand and put my hand over her shoulder, rubbing in small circles around it. Jen, I said. She lifted her face out of her hands. I looked her deep into her brown eyes. I don't know what came over me, but I leaned over the center console, pulled her gently towards me, and I kissed her on the forehead. I pulled my head away, looked back in her brown eyes, and said, 
I'm not going anywhere. She smiled and said with a shaky tone, Good. You're all I got. She sniffled, shifted the car back into drive, and pulled back out on the Travis Street. We got to school about 30 minutes early. She pulled into a spot that was close to the exit. We just sat there for a minute, in complete silence. About 10 minutes later, Adam opened the door and got in. So, we doing this? Adam asked. Yeah, Jen said. Before we go, I have to say something, I proclaimed. I turned around and looked back at Adam. Adam, I said. I never said thank you for sticking up for me. At the gym, in the woods, I never... Mark, it's no problem, dude, he said. Adam, I always thought you were that asshole jock type, you know? Some rich kid who never had to work for a thing. I was completely wrong about that, and I apologize if I ever... Mark, it's water under the bridge. To be honest, I hate Derek too. The guy is a stuck-up asshole. Yeah, I play sports, but it's really just so I can get out of this fucking bubble town. It's not looking too well like that's going to happen. To be honest, when my parents split, it was tough on me, but I just sucked up, you know? I thought I had to be this persona or whatever, but truthfully, I like video games. I like watching Wes Craven films. I love Nirvana, and I fucking hate that preppy bullshit. Smells like teen spirit, huh? Jen added. Yeah, teen spirit, he said back. Mark, Jen, let's go get Johnny, and let's go see this doctor. Jen shifted the car into reverse, and we drove over to Johnny's house. He came walking out in his ripped jeans, his RHCP shirt, and his Chuck Taylors. He got in the car and Jen drove off. We made our way back over to Maine and drove until we got to the on-ramp. Jen flicked the turn signal on and entered Highway 123 going towards Berkeley. The radio blasting out. With the lights out, it's less dangerous. Here we are now. Entertain us. I feel stupid and contagious. Here we are now. Entertain us. After about 45 minutes, we made it to Berkeley. Anyone know where the history building is? Jen said to us. Nope, but guest parking is at the top of the hill, Johnny said. I had forgotten that Johnny's dad worked here for a while before getting a job at Mountain Community College, which was a bit closer to home. Jen drove up the hill, pulled in the guest parking, and we all got out. Four misfits in unison. The jock, the skater the outcast, and the pretty one. Damn, we really were just like the breakfast club. We met at the back of the car. So, Johnny, I said, if anyone knows this place, it's you, I said back. Well, I know that the English department was down that way, so I would imagine history would be close by, Johnny pointed out towards the southwest portion of the campus. We started walking laughing and joking amongst ourselves. If anyone stuck out, it was us. Students passed us, I guess on their way to morning classes like we should have been, and we walked about a mile and a half until we saw a building labeled Department of History. We all walked toward the building and made our way inside. We looked around for a directory of some sort, but couldn't find one. Adam went up to a student and asked, Hey, I'm sorry to bother you, but we're looking for Dr. Lyle's classroom. Do you know where that is? The student said. Second floor. When you get off the elevator, take a left and go all the way down. It's the last door on the left. Her name will be on the door. Good luck, buddy. I heard she's really tough. Thanks, man, Adam said back to the student. We made our way to the elevator and clicked two. The elevator doors closed and started lifting us up. The bell rang and the doors opened. We made our way down the hall until we got to the last door on the left. It was labeled, Dr. Lyle, History. We opened the door quietly, but saw the lights were off. I guess she wasn't in yet. What are you kids doing? A voice said sternly behind us. 
we turned around to see an older woman standing there. We, um, we're here to see Dr. Lyle, Johnny said. Are you taking Dr. Lyle's class? She asked. No, ma'am. We're just here to ask her some. Well, if you're not taking her class, then you should leave, the woman said. Ma'am, we really need to see her. It's important. Well, then I should just drop everything to help some random kids who broke into my classroom, the lady said. Ma'am, the door was unlocked. We only cracked it to see if... Do I need to call campus security and have you kids removed? She said sternly. I pulled my backpack around to the front, unzipped the top compartment, and pulled out the book. Ma'am, we just need to know about this book, I said to the lady. Where on earth did you get that? Her expression changed from angry to shocked in a heartbeat. We got it from my grandmother's several years ago. My brother had it since we brought it back here. Ma'am, we just need some answers. We think this has something to do with the murders in Downey. She finished my sentence. Yes, ma'am, I started to say until she cut me off again. You four get inside now. Does anyone have a piece of paper and a Sharpie? I handed the book to Jen, reached back into my bag, and pulled out a sheet of notebook paper and a marker, the closest thing I had to a Sharpie. She took the paper and wrote, All classes canceled, 1029. She stuck the paper in a clear envelope that was already taped to the door. Get inside, kids, she said. Wait, are you Dr. Lyle? Johnny asked. Yes, and we have no time to waste. Please, kids, get inside the classroom. We have a lot to discuss. We looked at each other and then made our way into the classroom, walking single filed in. As we walked in, the lights flicked on. Dr. Lyle was the last one in, shutting the door behind her. We heard the click of the door lock as well as the sound of keys jangling before she dropped them back into her bag. She walked down to the front of the classroom where a big table sat. She ushered for us to come join her at this table. We each walked over to it, pulled out a chair, and sat down. She walked over and stood at the head of the table. All right, let's get started.